text says, Let there be light. God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The very first book, the first chapter, the first book. The very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 5 of that text tells us that in heaven we don't have a son because God is the light. There are around 272 different occurrences in the Bible where we see the importance of light. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn to our primary text in the Gospel of John. We'll be looking at chapter 12, verse 46. This is Jesus speaking. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. When we look at the Lord's church today, do we still see a peculiar people that are only following the Bible? When people see the Lord's church, are they looking at it as they look at all different splinter denominations out of this world and thinking that she is just like those. It seems that in the 21st century all but the faithful few have left their king and have demanded to be like the churches around them, much like Israel of old. And we're back in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 5. People said, look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to fit in with the nations around them. And we see congregations of the Lord's people that have bent the truth and watered down the truth and tried to incorporate things of entertainment value to be more and more like those out in the denominational world. And so we might ask ourselves a question when looking at this and the importance of being in light in Scripture. Friends, do we follow suit or do we maintain primitive Christianity? Certainly, times change. Our new evictions, various things of that nature, and yet, should the gospel, should the church change as society changes? For a few minutes this morning, I want us to notice Christ's church of the first century and how you and I can reproduce that today and how important it is that the light is still shining. First off, I want us to think about the effect of the congregation on those around us. We need to love to put the Lord's church before the eyes of the lost. The church is a bearer of good news. And it's also a shiner of light into a dark world. The Lord's church is to be a light bearer, just as the beginning of the Olympics starts with torch bearer carrying that light running through the, the streets of cities all around the, uh, the area. The same concept comes into play with the Lord's church. The Christian needs to be shining that light, carrying that torch of God's word and illuminating those around us. The scripture informs us that Christ's church of which he purchased with his shed blood is metaphorically a candlestick. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Listen to this. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now that word candlesticks can translated in a couple different ways. In the New King James, instead of candlestick, they have rendered it a lampstand. So a candlestick or a lampstand both have a specific function, and that function is 
that it is to bear and to support the life. Well, the text is teaching that this is a work of the local congregation. That we are to illuminate our community through the places that we work, through the contacts that we make, and uh, through the things that are done to the glory of God and in the name of His church. We always need to be a shining light. Sometimes we sing that children's song about hiding our light under a bushel or a covering it. Uh, the kids call it, no, we're not going to do that because we can't see light. Sometimes we choose not to shine as brightly as we should for a number of reasons. Maybe because of fear, being rejected, maybe because of apathy or uh, insecurity. But friends, we do that to our peril. Listen, if you will, to Christ's words to the Church of Christ in Ephesus in Revelation 2, beginning in verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against me. Then he goes on to say, Because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will turn unto thee quickly. Listen to this, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. So they're giving a warning here because they were starting to slip in their relationship to God. And they are being looked at by God as that life bearer in their community in Ephesus. And if they're not going to do it, then God is going to uh, remove that ability and take care of that in the way that he's able to do that. God's reasoning here behind this was that Ephesus had left their first love. Well, what exactly does that mean? I understand that to mean that they had stopped doing what they were doing when they first became Christians. The zeal and the love that they had for the Lord and the activities that they engaged in and the spreading of the gospel, the shining, if you will, of their life had diminished through time. They allowed it to diminish through that indifference or apathy or fear or for any number of inexcusable reasons. Finding themselves to the point of being so dim, they weren't able to accomplish the goal that our Lord wants us to accomplish as His church. Hey, the fact is, a dim light does not attract very much attention, does it? Now, last year at camp, <coughs> if you were with me, I found an exciting purchase when I went to Harbor Break. I found a flashlight that had a hundred and nine LEDs. So I would shine that around the camp, and it would just light up the trees and light up all around. And I got a lot of attention, especially by shining that in your face. Light draws attention. The brighter the light, the more attention. Maybe you've seen that old Christmas show, uh, Christmas Vacation. He puts lights all over his house, and when uh, they finally get them to working, the whole uh, block is lit up. Because of the light. And certainly the neighbors are blinded and trying to look out their window. So uh, a light can be effective if it is bright, if it is used uh, properly, if it's not covered, and it can accomplish what God would have us to accomplish as His church. Friends, we need to never underestimate the importance of Christ's church. As Brother Ido mentioned last Wednesday evening, we need to not uh, miss the assembling of ourselves together. We live in a world of darkness. It does drain us and it, it, it puts a strain on our relationship with God and, and with, with others because uh, we're trying to be strong in a world that's pulling us the opposite direction. We need that re strengthening. We, we need that recharge of heart, of soul, of mind, of body as we come together and stir one another up to love and good works. Friends, this church is the instrument that he uses to enlighten the world. Notice to the church of Christ in Philippi chapter 2 verse 15. He tells them that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Ye there is 
tomorrow. And he's saying to this congregation, you are shining as a light in this area. Therefore, you need to live a certain way. You need to live in accordance with walking in the light, which is purity. You need to, in fact, be blameless and harmless. Live as you are a son or a daughter of God. Remember who your father is, who you represent. We're never outside of the presence of God. We, we, we can't go on vacation and say, well, nobody's going to see me here. Nobody's going to know me here. So I can talk the way I want to. I can act the way I want to. Because guess what? Jesus went with me on that vacation. And we are Christians no matter where we are on this globe. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 12 in the church of Christ in Rome, Paul says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There are garments of darkness and there is a garment of light. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul writes to that congregation, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. For we obey the gospel. We are living in a world of darkness. And we are part of that darkness. But when we obey the gospel in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we put to death that old person in that watery grave, that one that is wrapped in that clothing of darkness, and we put on the new man, that armor of light. We begin living correctly, that will lead us unto heaven as we are living blamelessly and harmlessly, surrounded by the corrupt nature, but no longer a part of it. Walking as children of light. See, God is light, and we are his children. Therefore, we should show forth the attributes of our Father. Now, once again, let's notice our main text in John chapter 12, verse 46. Jesus says, I have come a light into the world, and whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. When we present the light to people, when we show them what Christian living is like, we need to realize that the pure light of Christianity often upsets people. We're not going to be able to live amongst that crooked and perverse nation without affecting some people that are rubbed the wrong way. And yet, within the church today, some, instead of proclaiming that pure life, they dim it just a little bit to turn that dimmer switch so that it'll still be kind of the light, but the message will be a little more comfortable, maybe easier to receive by those who are uh, living in sin and just haven't decided yet whether they're going to get out of that situation in their life. And it's not as bright and the Lord's church suffers because of it. I have a lot of older newsletters and things in my office. Some of them, the gospel proclaimer, Vindicator, those publications tell it like it is. They don't pull any punches. They tell exactly. You are doing this, this is where you are heading, and this is the way out. <clears throat> but today's many of our publications, new letters put out by brethren in the church, are still true. But they don't have that pointedness to them anymore. They don't have that urgency getting out of the error, more of an explaining of, of what's going on and, and just a nudging into truth. People can ignore that, and they do. Sometimes people get angry. Just like in camp when I would shine that light into the face of some folks, they would turn away and they would get angry. They didn't like the light. The lost can get angry shine the light of God's word upon them. Notice in John 3 and 19, and this is, a, is the condemnation. So they are condemned because of this behavior. That light has come into the world, 
and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Friends, the majority of people do not want to discover how that they choose to live is not in accordance with the Word of God or the will of God. They have no desire to change or even be convicted of their sin. So they get upset. We got a call here at the church building after our young people went and doored us in our community. This fellow was complaining that so that a, a youngster had left an invitation to vacation Bible school behind his screen door with that in his regular door. Now that is against the law, and that uh, he, he, he would appreciate us not putting any more of our literature on his in, in his door and, and uh, all this stuff. And then at the end, he said, "I'm going to let the, I'm going to let it go this time." But uh, I, would, I would appreciate you taking care of this this matter at the church. And, uh, anyway, what kind of fellow? What kind of person? has a problem with the young child inviting him to vacation Bible school. Well, the kind of person that we're talking about this morning. But like the light shining on them and their choices. He's an interested in having their life illuminated with truth. Christians of the first century, beloved, understood that they had an obligation to avoid fellowshipping in the activities of the lost and then, but rather, to convict the sinner. Is that what we do today? Or do the lost around us feel safe even in their sin? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, we are taught to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's a positive command, so we need to understand what reprove means. Reprove, according to Strong, is to convict, to convince, to tell a fault, and to rebuke. So if we're with someone, and there is a need for reproof, because we want to obey this positive command in this text, then how is it done? How is it properly accomplished? Well, with a loving tone, we should try and, as the definition states, convict them of sin, convince them of the consequences, tell them of their fault, and rebuke them. Now, before we do any of that, we have to take care of our own business. Make sure that we are living properly. And that's to be done in a private setting. Don't do that in front of other people. But you know, some may not appreciate our effort of love and trying to pull folks from the fire. And that brings us to our third main thought this morning. The shining of the light on the wicked and their response. They respond a number of different ways, but all are very similar. And we see in Scripture some examples of these responses. Let's look at some of these. Paul and Silas are in Philippi, and they are taken by uh, some of the people before the magistrates. And notice in Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> 20 and 21. And brought them to the magistrates and say, These men be Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. So here in this instance, we notice that uh, Paul and Silas are being charged with troubling the city by teaching those customs that are not lawful for the Romans to receive. So they're called troublemakers. And friends, when you present the truth to people that are comfortable with their error, they may call you a trouble. Because sometimes the truth ruffles feathers. In another instance, Paul and Silas and a Christian by the name of Jason in the town of Thessalonica, we notice. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, 
And when they found them not, because Paul and Silas had left, they drew Jason out and certain brethren unto uh, the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. So these Christians were accused of turning their world upside down. Now, friends, in the eyes of the world, they were disturbing that quietness of the religious society. They were uprooting the faith of some. Those that wanted to stay in their lost condition, it was just turning their world upside down. Paul and Athens, on another occasion in Acts chapter 17, verse 18. He's with the brainiacs of his time. And certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and said, What does this Babylon want to say? Others said, Well, he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So the intellectuals of his day, again, <coughs> listening to Paul, <coughs> they accused him of just setting forth uh, strange, the doctrine of strange gods. Something that was just kind of off the wall. Sometimes they have derogatory names for Christians. Bible bangers, Bible thumpers, holy rollers, things of that nature. Because we're concerned about following the word of God. Paul, when he was in Corinth, there's another instance in Acts chapter 18 and verse 13, where it says, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Jews are upset here. Paul is being charged with persuading people uh, contrary to the law of Moses. The friends Paul, before this accusation, it had been taught since the first Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection that the law had been nailed to the cross of Christ. Remember Colossians 2 and 14? Blotting out the handwriting ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and taking it out of the way, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That old law, the Ditch Commandments ended. All those ordinances were blotted out. The Hebrew writer tells us in chapter 10 and verse 9, Then said, He, lo, I come to do thy will, O God, listen to this, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. They were not living under the old law. They were living under the new law of Jesus Christ. And so they had to be taught. They were in a lost state. They may have been as comfortable as can be, but comfort doesn't save us. And it's hard sometimes to get uncomfortable in order to find truth. But you have to do it. Maybe you have a favorite easy chair at your home. I've got one of those Leg thing pops up and you get to sit down in there. And the longer you're in the chair, the harder it is to get out of it. That's why they make those that raise up, I guess. And so it's the same way when you think about these people. They've been in the situation for so long that they're comfortable. And it's hard for them to remove themselves out of that into something new. Finally, love, where are we today? Where we find ourselves? As I mentioned at the outset, I, I fear that many congregations and individual Christians have moved from their first love, as after the emphasis, to indifference and lukewarmness. If we've not been working for the Lord, let us remember. Warning to the lay out of scenes in Revelation 3, 15 and 16. Jesus says, I know that works, but he's still watching us, whether we're shining in the light or not. That they are neither cold nor hot. He wouldn't if they were cold or hot, one or the other. But because they are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. A dim light does great damage to the cause of Christ. Because it promotes apathy and laziness. And it 
tells the world that it really doesn't matter what their condition is because we're not really too concerned about it ourselves. We're just kind of enjoying being together, eating together, and, and uh, having those physical contacts. But as far as spiritual things go, uh, it's just really not all that important. Friends, we need to work to save the church and our current generation from doctrinal weakness and compromise. Remember Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and 16, telling him, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that do thee. So one of the places where this change this strengthening which takes place is the pulpit. It always saddens me when congregations out of the world, uh, even in our communities around, have opening. Uh, I know the fellow that they have placed in that position. Because there is a leadership capacity there that can lead a congregation one direction or another. Friends, I have always been excited since we began working with the congregation here in Brooklyn. Your desire to hold primitive Christianity, your desire to live as a light in this community. I hear nothing but good things from people that come in contact with you in the workplace, in the ball field, in the school. And warming to my heart to know that we're not just talking the talk, but we're walking the walk. We are living as the light. Yet still, I think we can shine brighter. Because uh, there's a lot of people in the community where you say, where's the, you see the Brooklyn Church of Christ building, where, where is that? And they don't know even where the church building is located. It's interesting that the Lord's Church during the first century was sometimes called a sect. We call that because it was spoken against by people out in the world that wouldn't stay in that darkness. They were having the light shine in their communities and it was so bright that it couldn't be ignored. Therefore, those who loved darkness reacted against it. Friends, if I had a candle up here, just one candle, and it was lit, and if we turned off all the lights in the auditorium, you'd be able to see me, my face, you'd be able to see a few feet around me. Even a little bit of light in darkness can produce enough light to illuminate an area. But imagine if we all shone with the brightness of which we are capable. We could find ourselves being talked about in Brooklyn. We could, but we asked them, you know where Brooklyn Church of Christ is? No, but my goodness, those people are on fire for the Lord. Could be that we hear things like accusations because we are turning Brooklyn upside down. The brighter we shine for the Lord, the bigger the impact, the more seed that is scattered. And the greater harvest our Lord will have. And it doesn't really begin with a collective sense. It begins individually with your choices, with my choices, and the culmination of us working together as a body of Christ. We can accomplish innumerable things. The image of the light has been happening throughout the brotherhood and <coughs> lives in this area. Shine forth to lead those that are in the darkness and have a desire to come out in the path of righteousness. Not member of the Lord's church this morning, we encourage you to fall in love with Jesus. We encourage you to believe that He is the Messiah and to repent of your sins and step out of that darkness through repentance and confession and immersion into Him this morning. That old lifestyle can be put to death that you can begin wearing that armor of life that will illuminate your family. You will then be able to pull others out of the fire of the Going back in the world, we encourage you to come back to the Lord. Just as the prodigal son, it's never too late. Realize you are lost without your father. Turn around. 